Today we have a very special guest, Bonnie Root. She is a Hollywood actress. She's working on a short film right now that is related directly to the topic of a woman's experience in Jehovah's Witnesses. How are you doing, Bonnie? Welcome to Witness Underground. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Before we get into your current script that you're working on that's very on topic of being a Jehovah's Witness, how does life in Hollywood work for an actress? And, and how, <laughs> how does- well, <laughs> it's, it's very glamorized, and I don't think many people understand, it, yeah. including me. If you know a complicated ex Jehovah Witness childhood, <laughs> uh, it unfortunately, was, yeah, yes. <laughs> it was fragmented, and a lot of my current work is about surviving a lot of those situations. We'll, you know, maybe get into this later, but like, I wasn't completely aware of some of the leftover like CPTSD and Mm -hmm. hypervigilance stuff that I had and how it occurred to people. I had a funny mannerism where if a director was talking to me and giving me feedback and it was a high pressure situation, I would kind of have like an appearance where my gaze would look like I almost had like a dissociative moment or something. It's called acting. It's make-believe. I feel... I started out in Portland, Oregon when I was in my late teens. I had, you know, studied drama in high school a little bit, but I'm basically could be categorized as at risk youth or, you know, disadvantaged youth or something. And I'm suddenly getting to study with someone who wrote, you know, the acting curriculum at NYFA or is on the, you know, board of admissions at Juilliard or NYU and is, you know, teaching at Tisch. And for someone in my position, I got to get a really good taste of that level of education and exposure. And that really, really changed my life. Uh, Action. You drugged me. You tortured me. You humiliated me. You degraded me. It was just for the movie. You're not the first scumbag director I've worked for. The worst, but not the first. We originally connected because you were the key actress in a film that played at the Genre Blast Film Festival, and I'm wearing my Genre Blast uh, yes. t-shirt right now. Um, do, what's the title of that film? Because I met the director there. <laughs> it's the most difficult film to search of all time because it's called <laughs> The Movie. The Movie, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. The movie, that, The Movie. Yes, and that's very Michael Mandel, the director and writer. Yes, he's very irreverent and he doesn't care if it's difficult to search (laughs) because it's worth it if you find it. That film, like I think about it regularly, it was shocking and difficult. And it's sort of like someone who's trapped and realizes it from the moment and it gets worse and worse and worse. But I was impressed by that film and it has some shocking bits to it. It's about this creepy delivery guy who tortures this washed up actress in her own home. It has surprisingly reflected my life to some degree. Mandel and I met, Michael Mandel and I met in a screenwriting class, you know, where everybody gets up and, you know, acts out the dialogue and you kind of get to see your script, you know, in motion. He came up with this idea and then we started talking about it a lot. And then the Me Too movement started and then there were just, you know, so many awful stories about the industry and that led to us, you know, talking about kind of in general, the public treatment of women and not just directors or writers or producers on set or the casting couch or any of that, but like the aftermath of that as well. The tricky landscape of all the double standards, you know, it's like, oh, if you get work done, you're gross, you know, and if you don't get work done, you're gross, you know, or what all of those kind of conundrums. It's only compelling if it's real. It's got to look real, Janet. It's called acting. It's make-believe. I am shaking the head of Janet Gillespie. Oh, my God. Uh, You're shooting this POV? As a matter of fact, I am. That way I won't ruin myself on camera. Genius, right? I thought it through, Janice. We came up with this idea that it was something doable on our own. Hence, you know, the one location, two-hander kind of set up. And we wanted the audience kind of go through this experience of the gaslighting and the slow, why is this happening? But I'm going along with it and I'm trying to work around it. I'm trying not to get into trouble. Uh, that whole scenario um, without giving too much away about the movie. Everyone go check out the movie, the movie, if you can find it. It's great. When you talk about like how you dust yourself off and take criticism and then try again, you're doing all that in front of watching eyes. As I was 
becoming a young adult in my professional life and starting to, you know, collaborate with other people on this larger level, I had a funny mannerism. I would be listening so intently to their feedback and I would be visualizing it and going like deeply into this, but I looked like this. (laughs) And finally, (laughs) there was a director I was working with. He basically was just like, where the fuck are you? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> go on a journey to the spirit world like what the fuck and it was like in front of everybody he was just like are you on neptune is it mars are you in the outer <laughs> galaxy like did anything get through and i was like whoa and it was very embarrassing and mm-hmm. you know sort of shocking in that moment but it helped me so tremendously because it had never occurred to me before how i was occurring Mm -hmm. That it looked like I wasn't listening or I wasn't, you know, taking in the information. And I kind of, you know, later when we were done with that particular episode on that show, I thanked him. I was like, thank you so much for handling that with, because he was such a humorous person. He wasn't a toxic person. That's the big Mm -hmm. difference. He was very humorous about it. It was, it became a funny moment where everyone was laughing. And then it was kind of an opportunity for everyone else that I was working with to be like, yeah, you do kind of do that, Bon. (laughs) (laughs) That levity of, you know, and everything made it possible to have this like really frank conversation. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. This is really good feedback. And then Mm -hmm. from, you know, then on, I started really knowing like, yes, it's important to acknowledge, you know, to make eye contact with people and to like, keep saying like, yeah, copy got that okay i got it i got it now let me paraphrase it back to you so that you know that i heard it and that i understand it that's beautiful i couldn't have written a better segue than that that your acting life and the pressures of set and shooting revealed something about c ptsd complex ptsd how something from your past that is partially related to the Jehovah's Witnesses, but also your script is about, but also what your other film, Sissy, that we didn't talk about yet, discusses. I wrote, produced, and directed a short called Sissy, which anyone can look up. And that was based on a true story from my life. Sissy is now available on Amazon to rent or buy. I have another project called Diary of Heather Keating, based on a real life trial that I was put through. When I was 13 years old, I was sent into a room with a big long table and seven or eight men sitting behind it who were opening up my diary and reading aloud passages of my innermost private thoughts had my entire uh, life and spiritual future on the line can you talk to like what this revealed to you because I feel like that leads us into your work in a deeper way you know from that point so I was really young when that happened like early Mm. 20s and it wasn't long after that that I went and officially got back in weekly therapy and started discussing with a professional, you know, what had occurred. That has been a lifelong process that virtually never ends. You know, it's like a never ending onion that just peels back another layer and another layer. And there's no real moment of arriving in this perfectly healed place. There's a lot of really subtle forms of spiritual bypassing and toxic positivity that are out there and kind of, I think people think like, just don't think about the past or just, you know, put certain things to bed or don't think about them, leave them alone. Or perhaps they think just, you know, working out and losing weight and going to a spiritual retreat or a sound bath or a ayahuasca sit or, you know, something like that is going to just handle it. And then you can just kind of continue on sort of with this, oh, I'm turning over a new leaf. And inevitably, I've done, you know, millions of workshops, I've done, you know, so much therapy, I'm back in weekly, you know, therapy for quite some time now, these patterns kind of resurface. And every time there's another huge, you know, lesson to be learned. Going back to that moment, that was that was the pivotal moment where I realized I was like, I think there might be something, you know, a bit heavier going on with me. Because previous to that, I 
I had sort of, again, I'll go back to this blessing and curse thing. So as a child, I was really outspoken, really verbal, constantly talking, constantly sharing things. And it got me in trouble with my abusers and my gaslighters. It almost always got me my reputation ruined. Those kind of people or organizations or communities or scenes or whatever you want to call it, when those kind of things happen, usually it's like a very inconvenient truth from a singular or a small amount of victims. And the easiest thing to do is DARVO, which there are many forms of. The, Can you describe that acronym real quick? Yes, so people... it's DARVO stands for Deny, Attack, Reverse Victim Offender, meaning reverse victim and offender roles. It's something that lawyers have been using for forever. Spin doctors use it all the time. I started experiencing that without knowing it, you know, when I was really young and started asking a lot of questions about my religion, asking a lot of questions about, you know, my parents and other people's behaviors and seeing holes in stories or seeing patterns in behavior and calling it out. So that got me into a lot of trouble. When I was younger, I would overshare with people indiscriminately. I think there was some kind of um, part of the hypervigilance, part of being gaslit and being a victim of Darvo that I desperately wanted people to know me and to know what I had actually really gone through, like in the shadows and in that dark basement, you know, proverbial basement. There weren't really like parameters. I didn't really know, you know, uh, I didn't have access to appropriate support groups or, you know, um, understand how to control that. And so I just started seeing my past, my childhood. I didn't really view it with the seriousness or the, the gravity. It wasn't quite clicking to me. I almost started making it into like a funny story, you know, like more comedic. Like I'm funny, silly. I'm like funny, silly, goofy bunny. I'm like, ah, my dad was old and he beat us and he was drunk and he was naked all the time. And it, it was super silly, you know, uh, to make other people feel more comfortable or to put other people at ease so it wasn't so hard to talk about. And then I didn't really understand how serious it was. And until I started to notice this feedback from certain people, right? Like being on set and having these moments where, oh, I'm under a lot of pressure and I'm just looking like I'm checking out, you know? But in my world, I'm like, no, I'm totally listening. I'm taking in everything. I'm probably taking in more details than everyone else in the room. I'm like a tape recorder. I'm like aware of every fucking detail and every breath and every micro movement that's happening in this room because I'm trying to make sure that I'm safe, that everyone's safe. Yeah. I had I was... no idea that that was, you know, what was going on. I, I, so... I didn't. I didn't know. So much of that resonates with me and I didn't have, um, well, things are revealing more and more over time as you called it, the onion peels back layers, but yeah. I don't see my situation as being physically or sexually abusive ever. Uh, maybe some physical stuff early on, but yeah. more the part that I'm relating to deeply is like living in, in that type of dystopian culture that is the Jehovah's Witness world. The risks are huge for any, any misstep. So like this person said that information or this person knows this information about me. So that puts me at risk that I will lose family. I could lose community. I get kicked out. And, and it's all really scary because it's not just like there's like two layers to it. One is one is um, hypothetical, like future, um, almost abstract in that like you'll lose your future access mm -hmm. to paradise um, because God won't love you anymore or you won't have access to talk to him. And the other one's real and it's like ever present that you'll lose your family and your friends and your community and you won't, you'll be totally cast out. Yeah. And that can happen for the smallest thing from having smoked a cigarette, having spent time with the wrong people, having learned something that you, that wasn't even your information, but you know about it. So now it's your, you're like blood guilty if you don't turn someone in and then someone might be turning you in for something. And then like, there's all these like layers to it, but the risks are so gigantic in both the hypothetical abstract and the real social world that makes up your entire universe. Because for most people, 
that is the whole world. And so like to grow up, like, I feel like the hypervigilance is like, it's necessary to maintain, um, any kind of calm is to be hypervigilant and know who you can and can't talk to and what information you can and can't share mm -hmm. that like that has caused problems in my life as an adult too. And it's, and I'm, and I'm 40, I just turned 43. And it's like, when, when will I figure out <laughs> how to be in this world in a way that's, that's healthy and, um, and normal. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, it's getting better all the time, but it takes work and it takes things like actually trying to figure out what these patterns are. And, and it's really helpful when someone does reveal something to you, even if it's in this shocking way, um, in public that like, Oh, actually that was, I'm so fine. I'm so glad someone finally said something. If everyone's been thinking that about me for how many decades, like maybe <laughs> I'm glad someone finally said something, but yeah. 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 Hypervigilance. So interesting. Um, and it feels like I have a superpower in certain situations, but I'm probably just like my, I'm overworking, uh, multiple on multiple levels, emotionally and met and logically, um, about a situation that probably is pretty benign. Well, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I feel like there are multiple facets to what you just mentioned. In some cases I've been exploring lately, taking the hyper out of hyper vigilance, just because there is almost an immediate shameful kind of, um, your crazy, uh, connotation that just, I don't know, feels really attached to that. So it's just you regular know? vigilance. Well, I'm just vigilant, you know? And, yeah. and what if take Jehovah witness religion, Look, if we just compare what's going on on social media and what goes on in certain communities or organizations where there's any power to be had or manipulated, mm -hmm. if there are any abusers or gaslighters or predators, whether they be on a smaller or grander level, you know, and there's some paranoia or there's other people who could speak out about that who need to be controlled you know, there are misinformation wars happening everywhere, all around us, all the time. There is so much distortion of truth. And there are people who are real victims where the people who have perpetrated, if it's sexual abuse or sexual harassment or verbal abuse or bullying or whatever it is, those people who have done those things are going to definitely be scrambling to cover their bases. And if they know anything, you know, about those victims, oh, she or he has a past of child abuse. She or he, you know, is this or hypervigilant or has complex PTSD. Th they'll weaponize that. Mm -hmm. They will use that and double down on that as a way to, you know, dehumanize you. Dehumanize. And that's just a part of this whole, you know, kind of misinformation. And mm -hmm. my girlfriend who I was talking to calls it the narcissism. I love that. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, Jehovah Witness religion is just one of many little microcosms that mm -hmm. um, reflect that. So that's what I was going back to is like, am I hyper vigilant or am I just vigilant? You know, like, I feel like having been a victim of being in a insular cult-like religion that with the constant threat of shunning and then all of this misinformation and cognitive dissonance um, and brainwashing or whatever you want to call it, being able to pull myself out of that at a pretty young age and pretty much on my own overcome the programming of that and have the courage and the fortitude to be virtually alone with no support system and just stand up for myself. Now, I'm not saying any of that has looked perfect. You know, I've, I've fallen for predators over and over and over again, or, or bullies or verbal abusers or whatever, because I just have that thing in me that is so deeply conditioned from that childhood, from that religion to just become paralyzed to cower and to just retreat and self isolate, you know, until the scary thing, you know, passes like, fine, I'm shunned. Okay. Actually, what you just said, was like the perfect soundbite for like, why I started this whole channel or why I started the XW coming out interview series, and why I made the documentary witness underground, you did that on your own. And it's amazing. 
because against all odds, they attempted to program you and they were probably successful in some ways. And the control systems are all there and you're like, I'm not doing it. If I have to leave alone, I'll do it. And then the people that did that, because you're not the only one. And that's like, I kept meeting people that had done something like what you're discussing in some way and then pursued the life that made them happy. And, and that could be anything. In your case, it's it's like regarded on a global scale as like exceptional in that you went into acting and you you you're you found a way to make it in Hollywood. Um, it's amazing. But like other people are like, well, I want to do carpentry or I want to buy a piece of land and never talk to other people. <laughs> like, okay, so like they're hermiting. But like for them, it, you know, like they did something and moved away from that controlling situation. And it was against all odds and on their own terms. And it's incredible that they were able to do so because so many people can't do that. And also know some feeling of freedom that like the average human can't know because like you're not just free because you live in a country that's free or like a society that is talking about freedom all the time and, and values that freedom from mind control and like the vigilance that you learned in that kind of situation it informs us about all the other systems of control that exist and the kind of people that are there and it's yes. a much broader tool set that we have. That is exactly. And that's why I say I've been taking the hyper out of hyper vigilance because maybe it's just perfectly fucking vigilant. Powerful. I love that. Could you take us back to that transition? So you were off on your own. Did you get any help along the way? Like, how did you go from having nothing and no one to this whole life that you've created for yourself, this whole career? Definitely when I was younger, had these kind of interesting moments where I was sort of like right at the precipice of that bubble where I could have entered the realm of being a household name or a brand or something. But for the most part, I've been like a working class blue collar actor, but I did find my way to acting and found my way to an acting class in Portland with this woman, Gail Abbott, who then later became my talent manager, you know, it was just kind of this random good fortune. Like I just knew I wanted to be an actor. I had known that since I was a kid. I just loved storytelling, human behavior. I've always said, I think a lot of that is tied up in the hypervigilance of growing up in cognitive dissonance and, and toxicity and abuse is that you develop this fascination, whether that <laughs> be good for you or, or not good for you. It can be a blessing and a curse. You know, sometimes you get really, really fascinated with mental illness or, you know, people who are incredibly flawed or can create a lot of cognitive dissonance themselves or environments that are like that. When I'm in my writing and filmmaking and acting mode and, and curiosity about that, it's definitely a huge blessing. When it becomes uh, alluring in a personal sense, I can definitely find myself walking further and further down a staircase into a dark and scary basement that sometimes takes a while to get out of. I was lucky enough to say, okay, I'm going to make a declaration. I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to use all of this hypervigilance and all of this, you know, as best I can as, as, a, as a wonderful gift and a blessing and, and a toolkit. And I found my way into Gail Abbott's acting class. And it turned out she had been an agent in LA previously. And she had kind of had a chapter break in her life and her daughter was living in Portland. So she was there and that opened up this whole universe. Like, she was bringing in directors and casting directors from Los Angeles and New York and was lucky enough to start booking jobs in Portland. I got a couple of like, you know, top of show guest stars on network shows. And then I got cast in a film that was a Sundance Foundation film. Before I even physically moved to LA, I got to go to, to Sundance to the film festival and go and have that experience. That's such a cool experience. Yeah, it was Your really. First festival is nothing like it. <laughs> I mean, that was a cra crazy. I feel like I feel like I'm getting so old now. Like I could do the whole like we had to walk uphill in the snow, <laughs> you know. Like so, it's like the Thomas Guide and the in-person auditions and you know all the clothing changes in the car and stuff. But I loved it. <laughs> it, it was great. Yeah. I was literally about ready to move to LA to start my career. You know, because. Like I was saying, my acting teacher who became my manager, all of the showcases and workshops that I had done through her led me to meet dozens of casting directors and make these really, really important relationships. You know, not only where I feel like people got to see my my craft and my dedication to my skill, but got to know me more as a person and 
what it had taken to get to that place. And I felt like that created a really safe space for me to enter a really crazy industry. (laughs) There was people like John Levy, who is a very well-known casting director. He's a really great book that he just published um, about his career. And he was like an early supporter of mine, kind of became like a, like a creative father figure type, you know, who really Mm -hmm. mentored me and, you know, was just a pivotal figure in, you know, introducing me to people and making sure that I got like put into the right hands when I came down here. You're talking about people that took on like a mentor role in your early career or your life. And I think it's really interesting way to frame someone helping you in the industry or that is like an essential role to to getting a job, to getting cast. I never thought of them that way personally. Casting director is hired by the production. They can be like incredibly visionary and just have such an, an, an insane um, level of artistry to the way that they mm. not only identify talent and actors, but the way that they identify chemistry between actors and just mm-hmm. have a vision when they look at a script and know you know, who would be good in those roles and, and, and even be able to see the whole trajectory of that, like how the marketing of that would, would work and how it would land on audiences and what kind of impact it would have. I got to do these incredible workshops where there were working casting directors who were present there, who gave feedback and explained to us how the industry works and what to expect when we would show up at an audition and how to conduct ourselves professionally. And Mm -hmm. by way of getting that education, you know, yeah, was that also an opportunity to develop a relationship? Of course. Whenever anyone important in an industry that you want to get into is able to you know, not only see your your natural ability, your skill in a brief performance in a showcase, but if you get to know them a little bit or they get to see your process, then they get to also see your work ethic, how well you take feedback, how well you can handle criticism, what a team player you are, what a collaborator you are, how you pick yourself up and dust yourself off and get back on the horse again. Um, and all of those things really matter. They, they matter so immensely once you're on set and you're under the gun and there's time constraints and and also just people's creative vision and reputations and everything on the line imagine if you have a problem or the director's not happy with the performance and he wants you to do a retake which is you're going to take five or ten takes on a scene right yeah i'm, I'm, I'm guessing from what i what i know from watching movies i've done um, a lot more than that yeah <laughs> <laughs> that, that like you don't get to go back to your trailer or like go be alone to work on it. You're like workshopping it in front of the entire crew. Is that is that right? Yeah, I'm a director also, and I coach actors, and I you know produced and been around sets in different capacities, wearing different hats. But um, yeah, I mean, if a director is of course very respectful and and very sensitive and very caring of of his or her actors. They're definitely going to, if it's sensitive, um, you know, going to pull them aside and try to be as respectful as possible. But, you know, that's just, there's not always time for that. There's not always the perfect situation for that. And, and not everybody has that kind of approach. <laughs> and I remember one time, one of the first sets that I was on, I witnessed, witnessed, <laughs> witness, can't get away from it. Um, <laughs> But I started to witness there was a second AD, like a higher up PA, who was being abused and I couldn't figure out why. So, you know, somebody was like the line producer was abusing him. Somebody else was being like mean. This kid, all I saw was like, he's busting his ass. He's doing everything for us. I was like, what is the fucking problem? One by one, all of the cast members are calling me. They're like, you know what? I think he's like this and like, little. And I've seen... Two other women with my own eyes on the show be verbally abusive um, to him and try to get him in trouble over such silly things as bringing flat water instead of bubbly water one time. Yeah, well, have you ever heard yourself talking? (laughs) (laughs) Because you sound like an asshole is what you sound like. I just, I saw it for what it was. Bullying. And I contacted 
the one other cast member who was on the fence. And I said, listen, I feel in my heart, this is what I have seen with my own eyes. I have seen this kid uh, working really hard, doing everything that he is supposed to do. I understand this is everybody's first like series regular role and you're like drunk on the power. But I was like, <laughs> I'm putting my foot down and I called the line producer and I said, I'm going to walk out tomorrow. If this guy's fired, I won't show up to work. I won't. This is unfair. What's happening is not right. And I don't care if everyone is against me. And eventually, um, the one other actor who was on the fence, um, he came over to my side and said, I'll walk too. And um, and then one other actor kind of came over. That scenario is, is really interesting to dissect because you didn't have to do anything. You could have just joined in or accepted that it's a toxic environment and carried on because it's a job and that yeah. stuff just happens everywhere. But like, what do you think it was that made you like put your foot down? I somehow just like sat with myself on it. And I was like, what does this remind me of? This reminds me of that disgusting rumor mill that I grew up in mm -hmm. that passed itself off as spiritual or good or some kind of fucking whatever they think they righteous. are righteous months later one of the guys who had called me to complain to try to get the guy in trouble said i i want i'm calling to thank you and apologize to you because i don't know what came over me i got caught up in a gossip train in a misinformation gossip train that Everyone was just giddy and high on how we were going to take this kid down. And he's like, I don't even know where it came from. Wow. I don't even know how it started. But you That's have nice. the courage to stand up and say that you weren't going to show up for work if this mistreatment continued. And I Let saw stuff like that happening with crew people on other shoots, too, you know, and I had there were like actors that were way more well known and popular and famous because I, as a child, was gaslit and lied about and had my, I guess, whatever reputation a 12 or 13 or 14 year old can have either ruined or brought into question. And I knew what it was like to have a kangaroo court of some ridiculous religion or social scene or set or whatever you want to call it, you know, suddenly come together like you're like you're suddenly experiencing Shirley Jackson's the lottery for like for real in life, you know? Yeah, we found someone to stone today. Burn the witch at the stake. Who's the yeah, witch? Uh, knew, we found a witch. I, I knew what that felt like. I knew what it was like to be in that position, frankly, as an adult. I have found myself in these situations again. It's really, really rare that anyone will stand up and question someone's version of events or someone's smear campaign of someone or, you know, that kind of stuff. It's really, really rare. And, you know, I think part of the reason is like, like we watch things like, right? Like we saw how the Me Too movement was this sudden powerful liberation where women who are still just like the last group of people who it's totally socially acceptable to make fun of and put down and dismiss, you know, have this moment. And then, you know, a, a group of, of wealthy white men, spin doctor, media press people come up with this amazing phrase that is instant Darvo called cancel culture. So now if you're a woman and you speak out about abuse, you know, you're an evil cancel culture person. Deny, attack, reverse the vic victim offender. I don't think I've actually tied the two together as so clearly as you just have. Yeah. I guess I'm playing devil's advocate in very scary yeah. territory. <laughs> for example, like someone can be called out for their bad behavior. Their reputation is ruined and maybe it should be because they did those things. Now they're being denied access for 
the rest of their life because of something that they did. And there's something about that that like feels wrong to me because of the Jehovah's Witness background that's like mm -hmm. um, shunning is, is there's no path to redemption. Even if you go crawling back on your hands and knees into that culture and you follow all the rules, there's still a stigma for the rest of your life. And there's something that rings a bit ugly as a part of society that like, okay, a prisoner did something bad and went to prison, served their whole sentence. They got out on good behavior, whatever. And now they're back in society, but they can, there's certain things they can never do. They can never participate in, in democracy in, in vote. And it's like, well, didn't the person serve the time that we agreed was like the, the effective punishment. And now they should be like back at square one. And it's like, no, you're actually a bad person forever until you die. You'll never, you know, it's like there's no redemption story to getting out of prison. There's no redemption story mm -hmm. to getting out of being canceled. I think one thing we have to be a little bit less hyperbolic about is taking a look at the reality of is it cancel culture or is it pause button culture? Because I could probably create a list for you in about 10 minutes of men who clearly have um, multiple rape, sexual harassment, sexual coercion, sexual coercion, harassment, or assault of a minor, or repeatedly uh, engaging in all kinds of levels of covert, you know, sexual abuse or verbal abuse or bullying and ruining women's careers. They get embarrassed in public and in the media. Okay. Yes. With the stories. And then they retreat and they do their contrition and they do their kind of humble pie, uh, 18 month paid vacation um, and go away. And then they're back on tour. And they're actually and they're back in. performing in the clubs and they're back playing music. And they probably during that whole time had a very large group of, you know, supporters who were still, you know, never questioning anyway. Um, that's how kind of sycophants, you know, work and whether they're even on a small level. I mean, you can have one guy in Topanga Canyon doing ayahuasca sits who's beloved by some small community there and is but is actually repeatedly sexually abusing and assaulting women in the group and then gaslighting and brainwashing them. Right. That's like a that's like a real thing. You know, I was talking to some so story as old as time. <laughs> some guy in an ashram. Yeah. It's such a big conversation because first of all, you have to look at overarching systems of power. Yeah. And, you know, this would be like um, trying to tackle the topic of racism or, you know, how right. women exactly. have been oppressed for millennia. So we're, these are different, slightly different contexts, you know, where you have shunning and banishment within a cult religion that cuts people off and there's a system of gossiping and turning on each other and this kind of blood libel like you know thing and then you have like this overarching narcissism of the world women you know being oppressed for however long you know having no recourse having so many instances of domestic violence rape you know i mean like so often for women, it's like, unless you are bleeding at the mouth, you've been ripped to shreds, you know, and there's clear, you know, wounds or whatever, there's just, there's nowhere else to go. And certainly if your, uh, you know, attacker is smart, covert, manipulative, highly manipulative, and happens to be loved by a certain group of people, the chances yes. of you, you know, being heard or listened to and that's been like the much larger problem over time it is tricky and there have been a couple of people who have been wrongly accused but then again you go back and you look statistically um what usually happens to women who come out against their abusers and what is happening we've had a huge shift of tides the the Me Too movement has been practically ground into dust and women are now back to being completely terrified to talk about any form of abuse because they see that DARVA works. Right. Yeah. Your, your attacker, your predator has probably for a very long time already been aware of the fact that you could maybe talk about him or say something about him. And so it's probably been planting seeds 
to make people think you're crazy or, you know, something's wrong with you or you're a bitch or you're not uh, credible, um, you know, and then if you come out and you say anything, you could be dragged through the mud in a public courtroom on TV, which we saw a couple of years ago, you know, you can be completely, utterly, and I mean permanently fucking canceled mm. to the point where, like so many other women over time, you just get put in the mental hospital. Right. You know, poor people, people of color, women, just put them in the mental hospital, okay? Just dehumanize them, criminalize them. It's really about who who has the power, you know, whether that's social power, <laughs> social influence. Yeah. You have to look at who who really had the power in the situation, you know? Like yeah. did they control the job? Did they control the the home? Did they control the, the career path? Did they control perception? Did they have more money or social cachet to control perceptions? That's the problem with, you know, the Jehovah Witness thing is like, they have all the power. Who's and, they in this, in the case of Jehovah's Witness? Well, we're talking about the governing body. We're talking about the elders. We're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, it's men. Right now power. it's nine men in New York who run the religion and it's about for every congregation, which is like at least one for any town above like 8,000 people in, in the Western world, three men minimum for the audience, if you don't know. It takes me back to like the comparisons, like if you were to read Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, you know, short story. I actually there don't are, remember that. I've probably heard of it or seen so it. There's a village and there's a, high, a clear hierarchy that is described. And, you know, once a year there's a lottery that happens. Oh, yeah. And, okay. You know, and everyone gossips about it and talks about it. And the person is picked at random. Okay. It's, it's numbers out of a hat. It's just like a, you know, but they're already working on their story of why the person deserved it. And mm -hmm. it's, I mean, you could go back and analyze it, but a lot, a lot of it, you know, goes into feminism and classism and everything because it always ends up being like, it's somebody poor. It's usually a woman. It's, you, you know, like, Whoever's the most disempowered in a situation or disenfranchised in a situation, and then you also view that through the systems of patriarchy and misogyny and et cetera, like, we just need to find a scapegoat. This brings up something that Chad Rieger in my film, Witness Underground, um, mentions. They have to do character assassination once you're kicked out or once you leave the religion. It doesn't even matter what you did or why you left. They will invent a whole story about about you as a and why you're not a good person or why you're not a worthy person or why you're somehow you there's something wrong with you individually why that why you can't come back or why you don't believe and it's almost always just like a mountain of lies that are completely disconnected like some people say that you're you just were like enticed by sex or another person was it's about drugs another one is like you couldn't pick your friends well enough or you're attracted to satanic something and, and they just go on and on and on. Like for me, I, I read Wikipedia. I read an encyclopedia about one topic and I was like, oh my God, like this is everything that they've told me I can't read. I finally read a tiny thing about science. I was like, I can't, I can't believe I'm such an idiot. And, and I was like, there's not just one thing. Of course, it's like, that was just like the th first thread that I pulled that was, in, or maybe the last thread that I pulled that was important to me. Um, that was keeping my faith house of cards real for me. Mm -hmm. erected um but the character assassination that they do is like i've heard my own family members in front of me when i've confronted them they like they'll just revert back to the story that they've been telling themselves for what was then like a decade it's like you do you think that of me like that was never true that was never true in the religion nor after that's not true it's not a it's yeah. not about me that's in your head like what are you doing like why would you say that and it's like oh they have to invent this story for them to be okay with murdering the person in the lottery in public or, mm -hmm. or destroying, you have to destroy the character of the person that you you're now treating terribly for the rest of your life. Like witnesses choose to treat people badly every day and they have to because they're, for, they're coerced to, in a way they're like the real victim, right? Like the actual individuals, like the system, like you the call it the narcissism, <laughs> right? We're all I victims like that, of it. I mean, that's yeah. why I, I'm starting to view, you know, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to eventually become a recluse or something. I, I really like, 
I've gotten to a point in my life where my now, especially at this juncture, right at this juncture, my criteria and standards for what I deem a safe space, Mm. you know, is usually just purely surrounded by other people who are survivors because it's like, it's like once you've survived something like growing up a witness and leaving or being raped and not being believed or being, um, the, you know, the victim of verbal, emotional abuse, you know, et cetera. And and no one believing you, like the wool is pulled from your eyes Mm -hmm. in a way that you can never go back. Yeah, exactly. And people who haven't gone through that initiation by fire will never understand. They're not going to see the world the same way. And that's why I'm taking the hyper out of hyper vigilant because it's just fucking vigilance. It's just an appropriate amount of care and judgment. I mean, I can compare it to social scenes, music scenes, a workplace, a religion, a spiritual guru, even a a yoga class. Okay. I used to go to Bikram for years, you know, and like my friend was raped by him while I sat in the lobby outside on the other side of the door. And we went to breakfast and laughed about it and said, Oh, he's so funny. Guys are so creepy and gross and like, you know, and so weird. And then I find myself 20 years later, you know, talking to LAPD and giving my testimony to try to have this motherfucker extradited it's everywhere and and people will go with the crowd right they will they will come come to the understanding right that some oh I've heard that someone's been banished I heard that we don't like someone anymore right there's a bad person that we don't like anymore I'm not going to ask about it I'm not going to look into it I'm not going to call the person or contact them or ask for their side of this I'm not going to Nope. There's just, um, just public opinion. It's just public opinion. And we're going to go along with that. And we're just going to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's a very fucking confusing existence because, Hey, sometimes, sometimes that story is true. Sometimes a person comes forward and says, this person who you all love raped me. This person who you all love and adore and think is harmless bullied and verbally abused me to the point where I was suicidal. And it's true. Yeah. But, you know, that's why I say, like, being amongst other people who I know for a fact really are survivors, and you can tell they're headlong in the deep self-work and yeah, you can feel it. You can feel it in the air. You can feel it in the real fear and pain of what they've experienced and how they're now looking at the world with real and honest eyes, not with tribalistic views and simplistic black and white views you know, to understand that there's always so much more at play underneath what's going on. There's something that comes to mind that have you heard of flying monkeys. Oh, monkeys. flying monkeys. Yes, I do know. What flying okay. Monkeys are. So I'll, yeah. I'll just try to paraphrase if you can correct me because you, I feel like you know more about this topic. You've made two films on the topic. The people that are close to the abuser, who the abuser is always working to like position themselves in a place of power while also diminishing your reputation so that when the time comes where the victim exposes the abuser for what they have done, the people that are surrounding the abuser believe the abuser, not the victim, because they've been being conditioned by the abuser for this moment as a plan by the abuser, because the abuser knows they're going to need people on their side because really they're playing a social game. Did I, did I get that right? That's a very typical, um, you know, kind of tactic. I, I actually, you know, found an old journal. Um, one of my early boyfriends, not like my first, but I don't know, it was like maybe second or third boyfriend, a guy that I dated for like a year and a half, two years right before I moved to LA, I wrote in my journal, I said, there's this really interesting thing happening 
where whenever I go to a party or a family function or a public function with this guy, he will like lean in and say something in my ear, like you look fat in those pants or, oh, I forgot to tell you there's a girl that's going to be here who I fucked. And then I would have a response where I would be like sort of shell shocked or like, um, you know, sort of the color drain from my face, or I would be like sort of like paralyzed in a way, or, or I would start to cry. And then we would walk into this situation and he would do this behavior where he would go, I don't know what to do about her. I don't know what to do. It's she cries all the time. Uh, and, and just has these, you know, collapses, uh, and she's so weird. Wow. And I was, I was actually able to identify it. I didn't know what to call it. I didn't know that he was actually actively smearing my reputation or, or trying to make me appear like I was unstable, but I knew that, that he was just being an asshole, right? Like I right, just, yeah. and there was a pattern of it and okay. I wrote it out in my, in my diary. And then like I was telling you about the thing that happened to me on set, moving forward in life, whenever I was at a party or a function and I would see a guy doing this behavior and a girl crying in the bathroom or, you know, looking shell shocked. I would go fucking vigilance and go, I know what this is. Mm. I know what this is. Yeah. I, I mean, would you call them out or just sort of like, recognize? Oh, hell yes. There have been many times I have had so many women circle back to me in my life and say, you're the only person. You're the only person who came forward and said to me, I know what he's up to. This is a typical misogynistic gaslighting thing. It's guys who want to play the field. They want to look single at the party. There's a girl who's at this party who they're interested in flirting with or someone who they're setting up to be their next supply, someone that they're going to springboard to after you're out of the picture, but they're slow boil kind of convincing everyone in this atmosphere that you're just a pain in the ass, crazy person. But let me ask you this. What did he say to you right before you guys walked in here? What, or what did he say to you five minutes before you started crying in this bathroom? You know, was there a put down? Did he triangulate you against someone else? Did he just suddenly out of nowhere start verbally abusing you and putting you down? Because that might be the reason why you're crying in this bathroom, sweetheart. Not because you're overly sensitive or you're too jealous or there's something wrong with you. You're being gaslit. Mm -hmm. And some of these people here at this gathering are flying monkeys and he's darvo you. It's all happening all at the same time. And I'm not saying that there aren't, you know, cases where there are women out there who do this too, because there are, I've actually met some of them. I've worked with some of them. <laughs> like, well, I've also made it a pattern of dating them <laughs> and I'm realizing it in the last few years, like, Oh, that's not just this situation. I've experienced this kind of thing before. Um, and it's, and it's not that like, there's only a few, um, I feel like because of the background we're discussing that we, we share of growing up in this bizarre environment, like that hi those hierarchies aren't just like, okay, there's people that want power. There's also victims being um, conditioned to be victims so that when you do leave, you're like, okay, well, what feels comfortable and, and natural? Well, I'm going to, that person across the room or this person at the party or this person at the bar, like they're the most. I, I, I feel comfortable approaching this person and you yeah. go approach this person who happened to be, um, well, happened to have those characteristics that they have probably been conditioned to have. Like I almost, the people that I've gotten close to who have been a, like abusive in my life, I get to the point after experiencing it, like they're actually, they're doing all these terrible things that are affecting my life for the worst, but I also feel pity for them. And, um, what I've learned is like, there's really nothing you can do to help these people. They're sort of like conditioned to be terrible and they can't help it. And they're not really happy either. But like, 
I don't know, there's, there's a lot to say there, but yeah, there's also women yeah. who do this. There's all kinds of human do humans do this and they probably had a terrible childhood <laughs> that have made them this way. And it's deep yeah. conditioning that they would probably have to work for the rest of their lives to uncondition. I found something that's also really interesting to me is that oftentimes one, one of the things that's now become a sort of sign or red flag, it's the exact combination of there being some pretty intense abuse and neglect within the family dynamic, but that person is still deeply, deeply entrenched and involved in the family dynamic and is still actively participating in the denial and gaslighting um, overall system of the family, which leads to um, manipulative or maybe even possibly narcissistic behavior as an adult, because it's perpetuated unconsciously by the family. With me and my younger sibling and my older brother, like we all did a hard pivot and completely cut off and exited from the family. And then I had to learn about the world and like get into therapy right away and then like do hardcore reflection. And then I was like, I, refuse to participate in this dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, unfortunately I end up on the opposite side of the same coin because I too, I am intensely attracted to figures that are hyper controlling, bullying, over overwhelming. And I struggle to be that for myself all the mm -hmm. time. And so Yes, that's a part of the conditioning. And that's something I'm still I'm still unpacking. And I'm hoping this new decade of my life and like kind of coming into like real serious adult womanhood that I'm I'm very ready to disconnect from that need and to just kind of stay in whatever discomfort I feel, you know, if there's a feeling of anxiety or, you know, a feeling of indecisiveness or whatever it is that I'm committed to sit with that and embrace not to dissociate and yeah, not to dissociate to like, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm right now, like, and, and for some time now have been specifically finding environments that I know are safe where there are groups of women and survivors who are looking to empower ourselves. And then I start to feel empowerment in that safety. And then I feel like, well, that's my world where I can be really authentic and open about the pain that I'm in or what I'm experiencing. And then I start to associate and draw people like that into my business and my creative world. And then now that's, um, you know, created a trajectory for me where, I feel like finally my mission statement and my dreams are coming true now because I'm aligning with other female filmmakers or other men in the industry who are, you know, really, really safe spaces and, and are really huge supporters of this kind of storytelling and channeling all of that, you know, into that and then stepping into the leadership position and saying, yes, I have the wisdom and experience now and I'm finally emotionally um, stable enough in my world to be the producer, to be right. the director, to lead people in this conversation about abuse, gaslighting, grooming, et cetera, in a responsible and compassionate way. That's not in a victim role necessarily, you know, I mean, owning that there has been victimization, but not coming from a disempowered victim stance. Um, not coming from anger. I have experienced great righteous anger towards my former abusers, but I also come from and feel an insane amount of compassion because they know not what they do. Yeah. Truly. They are I living actually, in yeah. such intense fear. You must be sissy. He's my uncle. I feel like Sissy does an incredible job of doing something groundbreaking and new in demonstrating grooming and what it results in and how it overwhelms, especially someone who's younger. I wrote, produced, and directed a short called Sissy, and that was based on a true story from my life. So very broken and my parents divorced and everything was really, really a mess and kind of convoluted and still entangled with the whole 
you know, Jehovah Witness situation. I found myself basically, you know, uh, being turned over to um, an adult male when I was 14 on the verge of turning 15. Um, and we were traveling across the Southwest states. I was alone with him for several months. People always like you in the beginning and then they get to know you and they see what you're really like and they don't want to be around you anymore. I'm running through the streets in nothing but my cowboy boots and a pair of underpants. And I'm half cocked because, uh, well, I've been drinking wild turkey since about three in the afternoon. When are you going to be back? I don't know, a couple hours. You must be sissy. He's my uncle. This takes all the concentration of all four of us in here to raise this. Why are you looking at me like that? At first, I was told that it was going to be a trip where we would have fun and he was a performer and a magician and a comedian and we were going to go to Vegas and Reno and I would be his assistant. And so I was, you know, love bombed and gaslit. It just started with those, you know, very small things, but he would have these very big, wild, I don't know if he, you know, had rapid cycling bipolar or like what, I honestly can't diagnose the guy, but I just know that he was having tantrums fits, breakdowns. And within those, he would have to try to find a way to blame me for them. And coming from the background that I came from, you know, I would become confused. One part of me was saying, this guy's crazy. And why is he ranting and raving and having this huge blow up over all these little things? You know, and then the other part of me would be like, well, maybe I am really stupid. I'm really dumb. And I deserve this. And eventually, you know, um, that relationship deepened and broadened into a situation where I was in complete survival mode. He would subtly imply leaving me behind, subtly imply that he would send me home or, or that I was worthless or that, you know, um, I just hadn't been up to snuff or I was a burden now or whatever. And eventually you know, um, thoughts started to creep into my head. If I could offer certain things to him, perhaps uh, that would keep me safe. And I, as an adult now, you know, who, you know, is in treatment and, and, and everything, I applaud my younger self for that wisdom and insight um, to do what I had to do in the moment to survive. Um, but it is a very complex kind of sexual abuse that occurred. And, um, and I went most of my adult life believing that I was the instigator of it and that it was all my fault and that I somehow was inherently guilty of some kind of inappropriate sexual behavior. That was something that was set in my mind by some of my Jehovah Witness family members. I was put through a very nasty trial regarding a family member who also tried to seduce me and get me into an inappropriate relationship. I was blamed for having enticed him. I was just about two months past my 14th birthday. I was blamed for walking around the house in my towel and being uh, sexually enticing and that the whole entire incident, repeated incidents, were all my fault, basically. I was conditioned, you know, and it was through kind of, you know, unpacking and educating myself about what this kind of slow grooming and love bombing does and how it um, damages your perception and your, your, your brain, really. And you can find yourself doing things that you would never imagine yourself doing just to survive a situation. Mm. And that's what that film is about. And I'm, you know, directing that as a full length feature on a much grander scale. It's so professional and it has some big name cast. And, and now you've got more time under your belt in the LA world with more and more connections probably than even then. Yeah. Did you direct the short? 
Mm-hmm. Who's the mm-hmm. short? Okay. The whole thing's amazing. And I really want everyone to go watch Sissy. And now it's the pilot essentially for a feature, which is so exciting. Sissy is now available on Amazon to rent or buy. You can get a song for a dollar too, but to watch a movie for a dollar, it's come on, just give give her a dollar. It's like a lot of life and and work <laughs> went into making that movie real. And that is all, you know, unfolding uh, this year. And finally, a lot of the elements that I've been, you know, meditating on and and calling in are arriving, and that's feeling pretty great, pretty. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, so excited for you. You've got a wealth of knowledge, and you're turning that into really impactful forms of art that will affect change in the world. But it's not your only project. What else have you got going on? I have another short film project that I'm producing on and starring in called Diary of Heather Keating. It's an homage to some of the girls who I grew up with. It's also based on a real life trial that I was put through. When I was 13 years old, I was sent into a room with a big long table and seven or eight men sitting behind it who were opening up my diary and reading aloud passages of my innermost private thoughts. And I had my entire uh, life and spiritual future on the line. And I was alone in that room with no supervision. So that film is inspired by those events and the cost of having uh, experienced something like that. It's a become a huge cause for me that I would like to become more vocal about because I feel that this is child abuse of the absolute worst kind. And they have male leaders within this organization who have no background at all, no training, uh, absolutely zero. We're talking, we have electricians and plumbers and roofers Uh, sitting in rooms with small children and punishing them and manipulating and threatening them in regards to their private developing identity and sexuality. And I think it's a very serious matter. And uh, I think it's worth a bigger discussion. It is kind of a composite sketch. It's inspired by a dear friend of mine who was my best friend at my uh, congregation as a child and my good friend and collaborator, Carrie Randalls, who's an incredible artist. She is co-writer and director and also producer on the project. We're collaborating on this. I'm so excited for that to come out. Can you give any kind of timeline to what you think is actually going to happen based on your experience. Oh, yeah. Well, we're tentatively set to shoot that this spring. Carrie's a very deliver and follow through person. And so am I. So I imagine we'll probably get through post in a in a timely manner and have something ready by next fall or winter and hopefully be starting that festival circuit. We are going to start making some visuals and information about that project available soon. So hopefully we'll have some links here where people can go and follow the journey of that as it unfolds. Yeah, let's get your audience built up. I hope that people that are watching this will jump and check the links in the description and go follow Bonnie's project. Diary of Heather Keating. And also check out Sissy. Those are really exciting. And I feel like it's going to make some waves in the world in general, but also there's a whole community of uh, former Jehovah's Witnesses, former people from other control groups, Mormon, Seventh-day Adventists, ex-Orthodox Judaism. Like I feel like the diary, diary of Heather Keating film that you're working on, that script is really on that topic. Anyone who's came from a high control religion, but also it's not just that, right? I feel like this episode, just listening to you talk about this topic is like a masterclass in abuse and narcissism and forms of control and systems of the narcissist. You've got a wealth of knowledge and you're turning that into really impactful uh, forms of art that will affect change in the world. So thank you. Thank you so much. I I really appreciate you having me on and having this discussion. Um, it's been very enlightening for me too. And the more I engage with people like yourself, the more you know empowered I feel. And it reminds me that um, these conversations are important. You know, I mean, even if my short film or feature film is in an audience with 15 people. And, you know, I end up having a really deep conversation with those people about, you know, the complex facets of all of this, you know, I mean, that makes all the difference. Something you said earlier about like noticing a pattern in your abuser 
or just in your life without even naming that person as an abuser. Because noticing a pattern that doesn't feel good, but noticing it, but not knowing that there's a name for it. And like all these things have been around for decades, but it's not commonly understood. And it's hard to even like fathom. You don't even know what to Google. Like we have the, all the information on the planet accessible, but like there's in, there's an entire world of a profession dedicated to helping people get through these things and help people yeah. understand what these patterns are. You explained and named like 20 things in this interview that are so important and fundamental to understanding systems of control and abuse. So thank you. And, and, and yes, and, and something else for, you know, victims to be aware of is it's really important when you notice these patterns to not necessarily go into a situation and try to call out the person that you think is the abuser or point out these patterns to them. That is where you will be putting yourself in danger. And if they're very, very smart, they know these terms also. And they will actually put that in their arsenal of DARVO because part of DARVO is using terms like DARVO, gaslighting, what have you, and reversing it and pointing it back at their victims. So go to safe spaces. I always say safety first, safety first. And that's why I find communities that uh, a lot of therapists, a lot of counselors um, are not trauma informed. They do not know how to cite or call out domestic violence or um, verbal or emotional abuse. Um, and they will actually unconsciously deprioritize your safety because being pro divorce or pro breakup is bad for business. So it's really important to get into groups with other survivors and places that are truly safe and truly prioritize the safety of potential victims. Is there any resource that you could put out into the world for any victims or people who are going through a difficult control structure, like a website or something? One thing I will say that really, really has helped me a lot over the years, and it's free, is Al-Anon meetings. Or anything uh, within that world. There's ACA, Adult Children of Alcoholics. Um, there are many groups within the AA community that are for um, people who might be going through various forms of domestic violence. I know usually that's attributed to when there's drugs and alcohol involved, but when there's abuse, there usually is other forms of addiction present. It usually is a fit. Another place that I really, really like and got a lot of support from is btr.org. Now, they do have a little bit of a religious layer. It's fine and suitable for non-secular, whether you're Christian or not Christian, their whole motto is safety first. We're pro safety. We're not pro divorce or pro breakup. We're pro safety. So, and they really, the woman who does that podcast and runs that Instagram page, um, really, really dismantles a lot of the nuances of covert um, emotional and verbal abuse and sexual coercion and sexual abuse within marriages, within relationships. Um, so that is truly, truly a safe space. That one is for women. So, you know, that would be for females in the group. But I would say, you know, anything under the Al-Anon umbrella is both for men and women. And the, and the best part is they have meetings everywhere all day long and they're free. And it's a support community. So you will meet people that are also in the work and will hear you and see you and, and do their best to support you. Thank you for sharing all that. One thing came to mind, I think I discovered Dr. Romani. You might have heard of her. Um, she's oh. just really big on YouTube and she has, she's mm -hmm. done some podcasts, I think. Um, she talks about narcissistic abuse a lot. And her, her basic thing is like walk away and never look back. You can't help these people. But um, she talks a lot about the details and nuances. And I mm -hmm. think I discovered her on recoveringfromreligion.org, which was really helpful to me because they also sponsor or show um, secular therapy dot org i think is what it is a secular oh. therapy project and that's where i found my first therapist which was like someone who had exited mormonism and focused on um on that as one of her main skills and like to have someone that really understood that was really helpful to me to what is that a, i want to write that down because i want to um, go there oh yeah <laughs> recovering from religion okay recovering from yeah. religion 
dot org. Right. And then in there, they, they highlight the secular therapy project. So it's a vetted therapist. There's already like a vetting system for therapists. And there's a couple different types of therapists. Okay. Then there's like another layer, which is the secular therapy, which is like non-religious therapy. They're not going to say like, well, why don't you read the Bible more and like, just think about heaven or the paradise. It's like, obviously that doesn't work. Um, and I was like totally turned off by the idea of like getting involved with any kind of therapist who had any kind of religious connection. Um, and I think anyone leaving yeah. any religious group like we have would probably feel similarly. They don't want to have yeah. that tainting the, the, yeah. the healing. Um, so I really appreciated that angle of it, but also they do another layer of vetting and that they have I don't know. I can't remember what it is, but it's like, I was like so impressed by it. And the very first person that I found on there was amazing. Wow. But I'll put all the links to all this in the description. I noticed within myself, you know, and I'm always learning too, right? Whether it be BTR or Al-Anon or something, there's just that, that hint of, you know, some of the God talk and sometimes just the little bit of already implied or inferred misogyny or, you know, just control group kind of stuff that comes along with that. I think it can hinder you from being like fully, fully 100% immersed in the work and, and being trusting. I mean, and I've been in like regular trauma therapy and like I'm in deep inner child work right now and like doing empty chair work with my therapist and like all kinds of stuff, which has been like so incredibly profound and and further unpacking the the religious trauma and its effect and why it's created these patterns in my adult life can you mm -hmm. describe the empty chair thing i think i know what it is but i would like to hear what yeah it's empty chair work is like uh drama therapy and um basically it's a chance for you to um sort of envision or let your therapist or the empty chair itself embody your abuser and be able to really fully express and communicate all of your feelings and thoughts with that person with parameters and safety and boundaries and being able to kind of consciously go in and out of the the exercise so that you're not losing control. And then the inner child work that I'm doing is also uh, interesting because it's um, allowing me to return to uh, places in my life where I was, you know, five or six or seven or eight. I'm not, I think what people might misunderstand is like the assumption that you're talking baby talk or that you're acting like a baby or something like that. It's just a kind of an exercise to give you permission to access that part of yourself or maybe the way that you were thinking or feeling at that time. I've been blown away by some of the more like poetic things that I expressed about the way that I played as a child or the games that I played or the things that I imagined revealed to me profound truths in overarching themes and recurring patterns in my adult life. I'll tell you one, one little thing like I as I was like trying to embody my five-year-old, I don't know where this came from. It just was like a memory. It just came out of me. It was like obviously not pre-planned or anything. I started sharing with her about a recurring nightmare that turned into a daydream that I had throughout my childhood that there were these bad people, like these criminal apostates that came in a gang and came to my house and they killed my whole family and I had to convince them and pretend that I was just like them in order for me to be able to survive. Whoa. And this that I had as a child. And it was a recurring daydream that turned Whoa. into an, an, a recurring anxiety attack that had me packing my favorite toys and my shoes and some of my clothes in a box that I kept and put under my bed because I, I had all of these distorted views and understandings about what, Armageddon was and then I was also confused because I was already having these feelings that the religion might not be real and then I had these big scary overwhelming fantasies about what apostates were or what like ex Jehovah Witnesses were and I thought they were these like satanic sex cult people in leather jackets that had like greasy hair and tattoos and smoked and were evil and did crimes and murdered people and you know, that they like showed up at my house and they were going to kill everyone. And I was begging for my life and trying to say like, I don't know, I can be like one of you or I can fit in or something. So it was just like revealing how, you know, there was like that side of me, there may be that nugget, that seed of something that was like trying to survive the bad people. 
-hmm. instead of just removing myself (laughs) because the religious thinking gives you that black and white thinking that like once you're in an entanglement with someone you feel psychologically like it's your job to just continue to survive that entanglement rather than seeing that there's another reality where you can just simply remove yourself from it and be in safety fascinating yeah i I actually would love to dive into that personally with a professional probably everyone could benefit on some level from that yeah well i could give you the name of my therapist because i love her (laughs) let's do that (laughs) <laughs> I can afford it. I'm trying to like balance the financial part of that. But yeah, the way that I met her was through she's actually starting her private practice in like six months, but I discovered her through an app that has a sliding scale fee. And okay. I started out paying $33 a session. Is it the better help app? Because I was doing that for a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In comparison, it's like, it's very affordable. The one I was got from secular therapy was just happened to be high because she's also LA based, but she's like $200 and 50 minute sessions once a week. And it's like, it's never long enough and it's way too much money mm-hmm. for a short session. But she was great. The few sessions I did with her were like so powerful and I learned so much and we got into some really heavy, deep places. Whereas like my therapist I got on BetterHelp was like really lovely guy. His thing is more like not really getting deep. He didn't really have a deep knowledge of the type of religious PTSD, complex PTSD, but he's more like, well, it sounds like you're stressed out today. Like, what can you do today to feel better? And like, we talk about solutions and then it's sort of like, okay, well, I could just like not waste an hour talking to you, but it is good to talk to somebody. I don't know. I, I liked it, but I was never like, I'm learning something. I feel like I got really lucky and maybe this is why my lady is leaving there soon, but I got really, really, really lucky because I've talked to a few people that did not have good experiences and had super like beginner non-knowledgeable. And I just happened to find this woman who's super trauma informed. She does several different types of therapeutic approaches with, I feel like great wisdom and compassion and knowledge. She's equally calls me out on stuff, but can, you know, go deep and then help me feel like I'm finding a lot of self-compassion and and deeper understanding around so many complex issues. So I guess I just like hit the jackpot. Maybe it was time. I don't know. Maybe I deserved a fucking break. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's cool on that app is you can actually change your therapist like instantly anytime you want. And it's like no, no extra costs, which I do like. There's lots of angles for this, but I'm really glad that you're like deep into it and yeah. um, getting a lot out of it. And so thank you for sharing. We should yeah. probably wrap up this episode. Yeah, I just thank you so much. It was. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Bonnie, for, for joining. For like so long. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. I love it. I'm really glad we actually finally got around to, to doing a recording because we've had yeah. so many great conversations before this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. All right. And for all the knowledge bombs. Thank you for the links again, everybody go check out sissy for a dollar. It's amazing. And it'll become a feature film. That's super important for the world. Follow her project called diary of Heather Keating. So we'll put the link in the description yeah. for the script that she's working on right now. And it should be available in like a year, but we're going to bring an audience to Bonnie root and her yeah. film soon. Thank join, you. join, follow the link. Thanks Scott. Right. Take care, Bonnie. Okay, you too. After I interviewed, Bonnie gave me a short call. Here is that voice note with some afterthoughts. Hey, Scott, it's Bonnie. I thought of something. I made a note last night, and I forgot to say it this morning, but it had to do with talking about Jehovah Witness and the conditioning. What better way to create future victims than to have a religion that is full of contradicting information that doesn't make sense and punishes its followers and then nickname that religion simply the truth. So the truth can be anything that they want it to be, as long as the governing body says it's the truth, it's the truth. So an adult who's been brought up in that is going to be unconsciously seeking truth from outside of themselves. And that's what I wanted to make a point about in the misinformation wars out in the whole narcissist system. The truth is subjective, and we never really do get the whole and complete perfect truth. So the only place we can turn to is our own internal truth, which is our own moral compass and our own sense of what feels truthful in our own body. Like that's so the body keeps the score. Your body knows. So that was something I wanted to say that whole little clip. I don't know if there's a way to say all of that somewhere. Anyway, it was just an afterthought.
What a wonderful conversation we had this morning. I'm still feeling really inspired by it. So thank you again. All right, thanks. Bye. Bonnie followed her voice note with a written note, and I'm going to read it here. I wanted to leave listeners with some sense of peace and a real tangible goal. We can make ourselves sick with that search for truth, quote unquote, or justice or reality, especially when we're so conditioned to seek it from a leader or partner or group. It's all inside of us. The truth is our upset gut, tight chest, choked throat, and aching head. The truth is there when you feel safety, peace, open heart, ease in speaking, balanced, healthy growth and challenge, support and authenticity. We just weren't taught to use that as our guide. We were taught it was bad because it challenged the faith. Bonnie wrote me another note after this interview to let me know that she has another project that's been greenlit. Things are just popping off for her. This is a feature that she's working on. They're calling it a desert horror. And it's got some big name actors and surprise, surprise, someone who you probably know from a very famous couple TV shows is also next Jehovah's Witness on this Follow Bonnie Roots project's Diary of Heather Keating. Go watch Sissy. Pay attention to this desert psychological horror that she's working on and all the great work that she's she's putting together. I'm so excited to have been able to interview her, have a developing friendship, and I'm so excited for you to all follow her work as well. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you like this kind of content, consider liking, commenting, and subscribing on this video and joining on our new YouTube membership or on our Patreon. That helps keep these kinds of interviews coming. And also you'll get access to not only the full interview, but also the art offer from each guest, which is a new thing we're doing each month as well as a live stream, live call every month for members. So thank you so much. We'll see you next time.